Good morning to everybody who is watching. It is great to have you joining with us today as we corporately together fix our eyes firmly on Jesus. In the midst of whatever circumstances you are currently navigating, we're gonna provide a space right now for His transformative and awakening spirit to challenge us, convict us and bring us alive. This is the power of His Word. It's living, it's active, it's relevant and I'm excited. I believe that Jesus can refresh your soul this morning. Always, when I like to speak, I like to encourage everyone listening to just stop for a moment, pause, put the phone down, take a deep breath, close your eyes and focus. Center in on the God of the universe, the loving Father who sees you, the perfect Saviour who died for you and who now reigns in majesty. He is for you this morning. This could be a significant moment for you today. Don't let it just pass you by. Don't passively just watch your television or mobile screen staring blankly at the moving images. Wake up. This is a moment to engage with the risen Lord. He wants to speak to you today. So put the distractions aside. I've got a couple of weeks, this week and next, to share with you. And so I want to make the most of our time together. Today, I want to speak to you about a principle that has the potential to liberate you from the weights and burdens that you are carrying. It has the potential to grow you, to give you your purpose back, and to make you far more effective in God's kingdom as you live out your life as a living sacrifice for Him. Then next week, I want to speak to you about the mindset that is required in order to live out this week's principle for the rest of your life. Living the Christian life is so far from just saying a prayer to give Jesus your life and then going to heaven. It's an adventure, it's a sacrifice, it's a lifelong commitment. There's a cost to it. And in order to prevent our faith from becoming overwhelming in the middle of this crazy world, we need a godly and biblical mindset to walk us through all the way from now until His kingdom comes. So today is the transformative principle and next week is the empowering mindset. And if you really wanna go deep on this theme, I spoke a message at the 8 p.m. service last week called The Rule of Love, which also works with this series. I spoke about intimacy and obedience. All of these are godly and biblical principles that I believe the church needs to pursue specifically in this season. And today's message is no different. If you have ever wanted to press into deeper intimacy with God, if you have ever wanted to survey His majesty more closely, if you have ever wanted the person of Jesus illuminated more clearly to you, then these messages are for you. I believe that they're gonna help you. So shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for this time together. Lord, I just pray over these next few moments that You would illuminate Your Word and the person of Jesus to us, wherever we are. In Jesus' Name, Amen. This message is called, Be Like the Moon. Its subject matter is this, humanity's cosmic quest for humility. I recently came across a children's book called Full Moon Rising. Its story is compelling and simple. It's a book that tells of a crime of cosmic proportions, a fable for us all. The structure of the story has three parts or movements. In the opening sequence, the moon is presented as being a celestial body full of pride. And why not? The moon is the great light of the night. It dazzles in the midst of darkness. The tides, the great oceans surrender to its power. Humans gaze at its beauty from afar. Children long to journey there. Astronauts compete to visit. Oh, to be the moon the centre of nightly attention, the glory of the evening. However, all is not as it seems. Eventually, the moon's pride is checked in the second movement of the story, when a bright ray of light from the sun opens the moon's eyes to the real source of its power, its glory and its radiance. The moon would be nothing without the sun, a dark, shapeless, formless lump of rock with no glory or praise. Everything the moon praised itself for was a direct result of the light from the sun. And so in the third scene, the final act, the culmination, the moon has shifted its attention. No longer focused on self, the moon begins to boast of the sun. 
its source of light and power. Humility reigns as the moon acknowledges its rightful position in the solar system. It is a journey of self-understanding, illumination and revelation of its place in the world. You see, these three movements, pride, repentance and humility, are our subject matter for this morning. Beyond a child's fable, these concepts are fundamental to our walk with Jesus. They are entwined throughout Scripture and pervade the foundations of our faith. They reflect the character of our Heavenly Father and they were explicitly modelled by Jesus Himself. The church is in a time of heavenly upheaval. There's no doubt that God is doing a new thing. We are in a new normal. As Christians, however, we need to remain razor sharp in our focus on the new thing that God is doing, not the various new things that the world is doing. Restrictions, lockdowns, travel bans, new economic regulations will affect all of us, but they cannot be the new things that define us. The wind of God's Spirit, the voice of our Heavenly Father and the conviction of His Word needs to be the lights that guide us during this time. The big picture in all of this is this, that the days of the modern day priesthood, aka a few pastors or celebrity Christians that are relied on to bring God's Word to God's people and to encourage the lost home are waning, and rightfully so. The era of the ordinary Jesus follower picking up their cross, laying down their lives, operating in their God-given spiritual gifts and bringing God's kingdom from heaven to earth are here. The harvesters of God's kingdom are households. The soul winners are you. Your communities will be impacted by you as neighbours, not by spectacular events or snazzy effects. God is doing a new thing, but we need to perceive it. Have a look at the words of Isaiah 43. Can you see it? The world is changing, yes, but crucially, God is moving and the church needs to go with God. And so this is the heart from which this message comes. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. I wonder if there is anyone out there like me that wants to see that lived out as a physical reality as well as a spiritual one. Do you wanna see yourself spiritually and physically transformed into the new creation that God has birthed within you? I think this is critical to the season we're in right now. God needs His new creations on this planet, us doing His work right now. Not some of us, all of us, because we all have something to contribute. The world needs us to be like Jesus right now. So let's do the kingdom work to get there together. To walk with God through this next season as Jesus followers, to become more like Him, to reveal Him to the world. It is my proposition that we as the church need to grow in humility, perhaps above all else. Humility is the key to intimacy with God and others. It is the key to witnessing and showing the world the love of Jesus. It is the key to community. We need to grab it, pursue it and chase it. A humble church is a godly church because Christ Himself was humble first. Hopefully you wanna come on this journey with me and believe me, it is a journey. It is no surprise that Scripture is full of the contrast, the dichotomy, the raging war between pride and humility. It's one of the key battling themes of God's overarching story. At its most macro level, it was pride that first caused humanity to declare independence from God, thinking themselves to be able to be God themselves. And it was humility that formed the pillar of God's cosmic reconciliation plan as Christ came as a lowly man to die a sinner's death on a cross. Engaging with this fight between pride and humility is a biblical key to going deeper in Christ. It is a key to being more effective in the kingdom. It is a key to seeing your life move forward. So do not neglect it. James 4 and 1 Peter verse 5 are two powerful scriptures that can be founding this discussion for today. James 4 in verses six to 10 says this, it says, but he, God, gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God 
and He will draw near to you. And then down in verse 10, it says, humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. 1 Peter 5 verses 5 to 7 uses the very same quotation from Proverbs 3.34. As Peter writes, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Two scriptures on the same theme. Maybe take some time this week to ponder on them. There's so much there that we could look at and unpack. But just like the fable of the moon, we're going to explore these scriptures through the same three movements or scenes. We will start by analysing pride and its indicators before discussing what repentance and transformation looks like in this area. And finally, we will centre in on the beauty and the power of humility and in particular, the humility of Jesus. It's important to share at this point that I preach this message to you as a participator on that same journey. It's so easy for a preacher to preach on humility and give the impression that he or she has become the master of said humble nature and is slightly condescendingly and smugly telling everyone else to get more humble. I absolutely absolutely do not want that to be the case here. I wanna clarify to you right now that this too is my struggle. Pride captures me and I hate it. So often in my own life, I put myself first, my schedule, my thought life and my behaviours get dictated by my own agenda. My ego so often deceives me and tells me that somehow I am better, more deserving or more qualified than others in various areas of my life. Sometimes my pride reveals itself as competitiveness, sometimes as jealousy, sometimes as insecurity or false humility. It's a virus that has to be removed and as I preach to you, I'm preaching to myself as well. So I too am bringing a willing spirit today and making a choice to allow the Holy Spirit to do a work in me. God's Spirit is like a fire. It consumes, it burns, and it leaves only the precious metal. And this is what I want. So today, ask and allow the Holy Spirit to do its work in you. Feel the heat of the spiritually purifying flames as they destroy every ounce of self-righteousness and conceit, and then marvel at the new creation that God has birthed within you. This can be a significant day, I believe, for us all. And so movement one of our story and our journey is this, the peril of pride. C.S. Lewis describes pride as the essential vice and the utmost evil. He writes that unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all of that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Pride is a sin because of its self-centered rather than God-centered perspective on life. We often find ourselves inordinately proud of what we have accomplished and who we are. And in turn, we don't give thanks to the Lord, our true source of strength. Pride so often loves to ask the questions like, who do they think they are? And don't they know who I am? Pride comes in so many forms and disguises. So don't be quick to say that this doesn't apply to me. We so often live like the moon at the beginning of the story, reveling in our own light and showing off our own beauty without acknowledging that it didn't come from us. Pride is like bondage for our soul. It crushes us. It causes anxiety. It is constantly competing. It destroys relationships. It puts up barriers to intimacy. It is like the addictive drug that we keep going back to even though it destroys us. 1 John 2 verse 16 reminds us starkly that all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Pride is fundamentally anti-God. Remember the scriptures that we read, God opposes the proud. That blows me away and simultaneously breaks my heart. As I am proud, I am putting myself in direct opposition to my loving heavenly Father who wants the best for me. I'm setting myself up against Him. I am in all of my folly competing against God. It's a horrible thought. And so if we're gonna embark on this quest to kill our pride, we first need to expose it. 
And this is sometimes one of the hardest things to do. C.S. Lewis again says, if anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud and a biggish step too. At least nothing can be done before that. If you think you are not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. So let's embrace that action point and do a quick six step diagnostic check on our own pride. Perhaps you can answer these questions in your notebook or journal at home or rate yourself out of 10 on how you think you are doing. These are the questions which have helped me so much in my own journey. And I believe they will help you to unearth your hidden pride and locate it within your life so that you can move prayerfully towards challenging it with the help of the Holy Spirit. First question is this, how are your gratitude levels right now? A lack of gratitude for various things in our lives reveals a spirit of entitlement and pride. Entitlement says, of course I should receive this thing. I deserve it. I've earned it. Second question, in what areas of your life are you acting superficially? When pride lives in our hearts, we're far more concerned with others' perceptions of us than the reality of our own soul. We fight the sins that have an impact on how others view us and make peace with the sins that nobody sees. Third question, who are you jealous of right now and why? Envy and covetousness are classic indicators of pride. We yearn for the honor and celebration given to others. We compete in order to come out on top. We think thoughts like, I should have what they get to have. Question four, where am I making exceptions for myself in my life in areas where I would hold others to higher account? I love this one because it is simultaneously so painful but revealing. This helps you realize where you are subconsciously believing yourself to be better or more important than others by the way that you're acting. You don't like it when others are late, but you'll always make an exception for yourself when you are late. You know the golden rule in Matthew 7 verse 12, and you know that we should be slow to anger and that we should answer softly, but you're justifiably angry right now, so you'll speak harshly and make yourself the exception. You know the law says that you are underage for drinking alcohol, but you think it's a stupid law. You're not gonna get drunk. You just wanna have some fun with your friends. So you will make yourself the exception. You get the picture? Question five, what area of my life am I most defensive about? Humility is never knocked off balance or thrown into a defensive posture by a challenge or a rebuke, but instead continues in doing good, in trusting the soul to our faithful creator. Pride, however, always tries to defend itself, walling itself up in its castle, refusing to be teachable or corrected. And the final indicator, question six, how are your attention-seeking levels doing, both in public or in private, perhaps even on social media? Pride is always hungry for attention, respect, and worship in all of its forms. Furthermore, it likes to prefer some people over others. It honors those who the world deems worthy of honor, giving more weight to their words, their wants and their needs. There's this thrill that goes through us when people with power or cool people acknowledge us. We consciously or subconsciously then pass over the weak, the inconvenient and the unattractive because they don't seem to offer as much. These are such challenging but revealing questions. I promise you they will help you. So let me encourage you today, take some time to answer them honestly and give them to God. He wants to help you move forward in this area. You see, once pride's toxicity and destructive nature has been exposed and acknowledged, the journey of repentance and sanctification can begin. This is the second movement in our story, the searing heat of sanctification. This speaks of the long road of joyful obedience, walked intimately and hand in hand with our Saviour. It's never too late to start. It's the road of transformation. It's the road towards discovering who we were born to be without our pride and ego, but with the identity our Creator gave to us. The relational dynamic with God becomes clear in this. Those who value being with Jesus will not only end up becoming like Jesus as the Spirit sanctifies them and literally forms Christ within them, but they will also start doing what Jesus did. Sanctification is simply a long word to describe the process of increasingly being possessed and permeated by the character traits of Jesus. As we walk in the easy yoke of discipleship, 
with Jesus as our teacher. So to stay with our space analogies this morning, consider a spacecraft as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. Traveling at incredible speeds, the spacecraft is navigated through a predetermined course from the vacuum of space into the atmosphere of the Earth. Objects entering the atmosphere experience atmospheric drag, which puts mechanical stress on the object and intense aerodynamic heating. These forces can cause loss of mass or even complete disintegration of smaller objects and objects with lower strength can explode. This is sometimes how I think of sanctification. It is like this guided journey into the throne room of Jesus's majesty. In the book of Hebrews, God is described as a consuming fire. He is so pure, so perfect and so holy that anything impure or unholy that comes in contact with Him is completely consumed, disintegrated and destroyed. Because of Christ's finished work on the cross, we are now a new creation. That was that verse from Corinthians earlier. We are spiritually united with Christ and born again into the image of Christ, made perfect and holy through Christ's blood. However, we still live in our fleshy bodies and our perfect transformation will not be completed until Christ comes again. The process of sanctification is the burning off of all of the destructive rubbish in our lives, the destructive thought patterns as we grow in intimacy with Jesus to leave only the creation that God designed us to be, made perfect, made holy. It is why Paul is, so able, is able to so confidently declare in Galatians 2.20 that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The defeat of our pride will not be instant. It will not be quick. It will be a fiery journey, walked out over time with many failings, many stumbles and many falls. But as our scriptures today promise us, as we draw near to God, He will draw near to us. That's a guarantee. And the closer God is to us, the deeper the intimacy, the more of our fleshy, worldly desires will be burned away in the atmosphere of God's presence. So give yourself space and time and grace for this journey. Prioritize intimacy with Jesus. Seek Him, pray and ask for help. Be intentional about bringing your struggles to Him. Say sorry when you make a mistake and expect the Spirit to move as you put your faith in Him. Furthermore, don't do this journey of transformation alone. God has already provided us help in the form of our brothers and sisters in our church family. Since our pride so often skews our self-perception, we need, we need their candid and honest and vulnerable observations of us as mirrors to help us see our blind spots. Often people will be hesitant to volunteer it. So we need to humbly and proactively ask them for it and make it safe for them to answer honestly. Sanctification is a journey. It is a community activity. It is painful at times, but ultimately it is glorious as the weight of pride is lifted from our shoulders and we can see the world clearly again. So my encouragement to you, make an intentional decision to go on the journey. You will not regret it. And so we can move to the climax of the story, the third movement, the heart of humility. This is our goal as followers of Jesus. Humility, it has been said, is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. And this is what we are moving towards with Christ's help. I love Spurgeon's observation when he says, the throne of humility must be the heart. I do hate of all things that humility which lives in the face. This quest for humility is about a deep, inward heart transformation. It's not surface level. It's the fundamental transformation of God within you. And it's possible for you. Do not disqualify yourself from getting in this direction. Jeremiah 9 verses 23 to 24 says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. 
Humility will ultimately reveal to you the majesty of Jesus. It will help you to take your eyes off yourself and live a Christ-focused life, glorifying Him and serving others. In the rule of St. Benedict, originally written in 516 AD, which sets out a humble lifestyle in a community who live, work and pray together, five levels of humility are established. Humility in our relationship with the divine. Humility in our relationship with those who have an official role in our lives. Humility in our attitude about ourselves. Humility in our attitude towards the circumstances of our lives and humility in our actions and attitudes towards others. It is worth thinking about. Humility is an all-pervasive character trait and it's available to all of us. I'll always remember when Pastor Cash Luna came and preached last year. He said that our earthly goal was to lift Jesus high, to exalt Him as much as we possibly can in our lives. However, the reality is that Christ already sits in the highest place. He is Lord of all. So how do we lift Him higher? The answer is simple, it's a game of perspective. To lift Christ higher in your life, you need to get lower. The lower you go onto your knees, onto your face, the higher Christ is to you. For the sake of love, for the sake of our mission to disciple the nations, we need to seek humility in this season. Great grace, the Bible tells us, is reserved for the humble. We learned that in our scriptures earlier. We find grace when we get low. And so just as I gave six indicators of pride earlier, here are six indicators of humility to ponder on and practically apply in your life. The first is that humility prays. Prayerlessness is the ultimate arrogance, thinking that we can do this without communicating with our Heavenly Father. Secondly, humility can be corrected without defending itself. Thirdly, humility celebrates people and realises that their opportunity doesn't take away from yours. Fourthly, humility seeks advice from other people. In an abundance of counsellors, there is victory. Fifth, humility is teachable. Once we stop learning, we start dying. And sixth, humility freely admits its mistakes, its flaws and its failures. It is quick to forgive and does not hold grudges. The reality is this, God wants to exalt us as His children. It is His ultimate goal. It's clear from the Bible. It's clear from God's nature throughout history. It's clear from Jesus' life and work. We do not serve a God that wants to squish us. We are His children. He loves us. And when we humble ourselves, He can exalt us. His reward for humility is promotion. What an incredible, incredible truth. I wonder if we can go there together. To draw this to a close, let us look to Jesus as our model. Humility is the seed planted in perseverance and servanthood, which produces the fruit of royalty. Philippians 2 verses 3 to 11 is one of the most fundamental verses on humility in the whole Bible, which explicitly links our call to humility to the character of Jesus. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This friends is our gospel. This is our good news. This is our Saviour. We are called to participate in this glorious reality. As Jesus was humble, so may we be. In pursuing this journey, we will glimpse His majesty and better be able to demonstrate Him to a lost, hurting and broken world.
Ultimately, we will live out our calling as sons and daughters of the Most High, exalted with Christ in the heavenly places. So I end with this, be like the moon. Go on the journey, recognise your pride, not to condemn others, not to condemn yourself, sorry, or to encourage feelings of guilt, but rather to see yourself transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Secondly, commit to a journey of repentance and transformation. Allow your heart to be softened. Come to a point of humility where your boast is only in the Lord. This is the final movement, because in doing so, you will become more like Christ. And this is my prayer for all of you today.